Okay, happy uh, Yom Atzma'ut to everybody today. We're going to learn today Shabbat and Dalid. Um, it's going to be good because at the end, we'll connect a little bit to some ideas. Uh, to actually, the end of today's stuff and tomorrow. Um, just so you know, we're going to have a lot of technical stuff to get through today in terms of animals and what the reality is and all that. But there's a prize at the end, you could say, because we'll get to at the end a very interesting topic starting. Uh, we're going to start with the issue of tochacha, of rebuke and the responsibility to rebuke others. And from there, we're gonna get on a whole long tangent of interesting agadito, including um, anyone who says David never sinned, uh, that David sinned is, only, is actually mistaken, he never sinned, and we'll get to a whole list of people who never really sinned, even though we know they did, and we'll talk about that. That's all coming up, so to give you a little sneak preview, I almost think sometimes they do this because this, these Gemaras are a little, technically um, difficult, boring, you know, getting into each animal and what it was they were, they would carry. Um, maybe some people find it fascinating, I don't know, but they, they kind of you know, throw in something very interesting and maybe we'll talk later about the connection between that and that is not today, but when we finish the sugya, why this is specifically found in this pair. Starting from the top of Nundal and Amr Aleph, very first line, harichilim yotzot kfulot. So if we just quickly go back to the Mishnah for a minute, so you remember what we're up to. The Mishnah at the bottom of Nunbet and Rebet said, a chamor goes out with a mirdat, that was the saddle cloth. Bizman shik shurabo, remember when it's tied, and we said when it's tied from Erev Shabbat. Then we said, scharim yotzim levuvim, which we just explained three different interpretations at the end of class yesterday. Um, then we said, rechilot yotzot shkuzot, which we explained was, they pick up their tails, tie their tails upward in order so that the males mate with them. Now we're going to have to explain. It says the rechilot yotzot shkuzot, bulot ukfulot, right? All three of them. So now we have to explain what the meaning of all three of those things are. So the shkuzot we explain. Now we're going to get to the kvulot. My kvulot, shemechablim eliyah shalahel lamata kadeh shalo yalu aleyem ascharim. Here we have the exact opposite. They tie their tails down so that the males don't mate with them. This matches more the libuvim. So now, my mashma dehai kavul lishne delo adit peirehu. How do we know? Where do we get that the word kavul means that it doesn't, so that it doesn't have, um, doesn't reproduce? Dichtiv, as it says in the following pasuk, they're going to bring a pasuk that uses the word kavul. Kavul usually means bound, but bound isn't necessarily bound relating to reproduction. So they say, uh, let's take it from here. If you remember, Shlomo HaMelech had this relationship with Hiram, the king of Tzor. He brought him workers to help build the Ben Mikdash, and as a, in return, Shlomo gave him all these cities. So when he gets the cities, Hiram says to Shlomo, Ma ha'orim ha'ele asher natata li'achi? Vayikra, uh, just have to correct it, Vayikra lahem eretz kevul ad ha'yom hazeh. Okay, he says, what are these places, these cities that you gave me? And then it says, and they called them Eretz Kabul until that day. So the cities they gave them were called Eretz Kabul. I'm just going to read you the next verse. Um, it's actually the previous verse. It's the next verse the Gemara is going to quote. By Yitzay Chiram Mitzur, you really should read it in this order. Chiram came from Tzur, Lirot et Ha'arim Asher Natan Lo Shlomo. He went to see the cities that Shlomo gave him, Velo Yashru Ve'enam, and he wasn't pleased with them. And then it says that he says to Shlomo, what we just read, what are these cities that you gave me? and they became called Eretz Kavul. So the question is, what was wrong with these cities? My Eretz Kavul, Amaravuna shayu ba b'nei adam shemechuvalim bekesef ubezahav. We said that Kavul is bound. There were people there that were bound with, with silver and gold. So that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Amalei rava ihachi hainu dechtiv velo yashru be'enav, it should be velo, not kilo. But it says velo yashru be'enav. Because there were all these wealthy people in the city. That doesn't sound like a bad reason to want to live in a city with all sorts of wealthy people. So now they're going to actually explain why it would be bad to live with wealthy people. In Really, it is, in fact, it was a bad thing. They were lazy people. Because they were so wealthy, they were mefunakim, they were spoiled, and they didn't like to work hard. And Hiram wasn't very happy to have a city full of people that blazed about all day because they were wealthy. Okay, so that's how we get that the word kavul, okay, so the truth is we don't yet get to how the word kavul means not to reproduce. We're going to get there soon. Rav Nachman bar Yitzchak Amar, so now the first interpretation of what Eretz Kavul is doesn't relate to our topic yet. The first interpretation is they were wealthy. 
It was full of sand. This also doesn't relate to ours. We'll wait till we get to the one that relates to ours. Why was it called Kavul? Okay, Kavla is the ankle. When it was full of sand, it was a sandy city. So every time you walk, your legs would sink into the sand until your ankle. That's why it was called Kavul. And the third interpretation is where people say, okay, not the rabbis didn't give this interpretation, but people said it. The land was bound and it didn't produce fruits. Now you have the connection. Kavul, bound, doesn't produce fruits. And likewise by us, the Rechelim were bound that they the bound in a way so that they wouldn't mate. Okay, next one. So we had Shuzot is so that they would mate. The Kvulot is uh, so that they wouldn't mate. And now we have Kvuno. That's the third. My Kvuno, Shemechavnim Oto Lemeilat. They would put this cover on the, on the animals so to protect their wool, so that their wool would stay pure and white. Kiditnan, as it says in the following Mishnah, um, it's a Mishnah in Negaim. Se'et, one of the Negaim, okay, it was last week's Parsha. One of the Negaim is Se'et, and they try to, it's kind of like, they give the colors, right? If you had a, a paint, or when you go to a paint store and you look for uh, the different colors. So they try to explain what exactly, where, how would you find this, in what color, where, what would it look like? And it would look like Semer Lavan, okay, like white wool. Might Semer Lavan, so they say, okay, that's not so helpful. What is Semer Lavan? Because we all know that when you get wool, it's actually usually not pure white. It'll have dirt mixed in, the animal walks around, it's dirty, it's never actually really pure white. So what kind of pure white are we talking about here? There you have the word mechavnim. It's like the semer, the clean wool of the ben yomo, of the one day old, which is obviously very clean at that point, which then they cover with this, they tie on this covering to protect it for so it stays pure white. So that's what we're talking about, that they can go out with that covering that they put on. Okay, so all these things are allowed. Presumably, again, we look at these things more as clothing of the animal, not as a masoi, not as a burden on the animal. And these are items, which we're going to see as compared to the next Mishnah, which we're not worried they're going to fall off. Okay. If we're worried they're going to fall off, then even if it's for protection or if it's for the animal itself, and it's more like clothing for the animal, still, if it's going to potentially fall off, then we're worried you're going to carry it. You're not allowed to go out. These are all things the animals can go out with. Okay, we saw the different interpretations yesterday. We saw three interpretations. We wrote in our Mishnah, it said either Tanakama says they can go out with their udders bound without a problem. Rabbi Yossi said they can't. Remember, Rabbi Yossi actually disagreed with all the halakhot in the Mishnah other than one of them. Other than, they actually, it's interesting, they don't really go into it. He thinks that the rechelim hakvunot is okay with the covering for the wool, but that's it. He doesn't think anything else. Um, and actually just don't, I mean, now maybe the difference between that is because the kvunot is something they would put on. It sounds like they would put it on and the animal would wear it forever until they sheared, right? It would go on from when they were ben yomo until they, they were sheared. So it could be because it was something that was worn all the time, it just became part of the considered like a bed, like a mabush, like clothing for the sheep. Okay, now we're going to get to this itzim yotzim tzurot. So we have, number one, Rabbi Yossi, uh, Tanakama, who permits it entirely. We have Rabbi Yossi, who forbids it entirely. And then we have Rabbi Yehuda, who said, yes, if you're doing it liya base to dry them up, then you could go out bound, because then you want to impregnate or fatten up the animal. Or, but not lechalev, but not if you wanted to it's express the, the milk and have it come out, you know, if it, you put this little pouch onto it, you can't do it for that reason. So now we're going to see who do we paskin like. Itmar. Rav Amar Halacha ke Rabbi Yehuda. Ushmo Amar Halacha ke Rabbi Yossi. So we have Rav who holds like Rabbi Yehuda. He makes the distinction. And Shmuel who says, no, we hold like Rabbi Yossi. It's forbidden. Nobody here holds like Tanakama, although hold off. Maybe we'll see an opinion that does. Now we're going to have three different versions of how this machlok at Rav and Shmuel came about. One is that one said Halacha like Rabbi Yehuda. The other said Halacha like Rabbi Yossi. Some people say that they actually said the halacha directly. And instead of saying, this one says like this and this one says like that, they each just said what the halacha is. No different. It's just the wording was different. 
Rav Amar liyabesh mutar v'lo lechalev, which is Rav Yehuda, he just said, this is the halacha. Ushmol Amar echadze v'yachadze asur. And Shmuel said, no, both are forbidden. But the third version is a little bit different. It's still the conclusion is going to be the same, but how they get to the conclusion, at least it, it's not necessarily different, but we get a little more background into why they concluded, or at least why one of them concluded what he concluded. So, sorry, let's read it better. Some people read, heard their interpretation, was said about the following Brighta. Now we're going to read a new Brighta. Izim yotzot tzurot, okay, according to this, Tanakama again says they can go tzurot, but this Tanakama says, liyabesh avalo lechalei. The Tanakama here matches Rabbi Yehuda, only if they're drying them out, but not if you're milking. Mishum Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera, which is not the same Rabbi Yehuda. Our Rabbi Yehuda and our Mishnah is Rabbi Yehuda bar Rabbi Eli, who's a later Tana. Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera was earlier than him. In the name of Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera, Amru, kach Really, that is the halacha, that we make this distinction between lechalev and liyabesh. Aval, but he says that there's a problem with that. And it's, what he says is basically, theoretically, I agree. However, what's the problem? Mi mefis, ez liyabesh, ve ez lechalev. Who's going to, literally, it means who's going to do a lottery to figure it out. Meaning, if you see one of these izim walking around with their udders bound on Shabbat, you're going to have no idea whether it was done to dry out the udders, or whether it was done to, to basically catch the milk or, or something having to do with the milk. So you won't know why it's being done. So if it's not clear to the average person who's looking, now what's the problem? It really shouldn't matter. It's what the owner intended. But here we see, no, it matters, and we saw this before about what people are gonna think. When they see your animal going out, they're gonna think that what? That it's allowed for any purpose, because they won't know that you're doing it, not necessarily lechalev, and they'll think, that you can, you're, you can go out with the udders bound in any situation. And therefore, he says, Since it's not noticeably different, you bind it in the same way. Therefore, since people won't be able to tell the difference, it's forbidden in every case. So this comes to explain why the opinion that holds that it's forbidden in all cases, which is Rabbi Yossi, really, and it's going to be um, Shmuel, who says, like Rabbi Yossi, or in this case, it's going to be like Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera. It's not clear if that's what Rabbi Yossi forbids or not, but it's clear that Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera, who holds the same position as Rabbi Yossi, that's forbidden in all circumstances, forbids really not from the letter of the law, but because of what it will look like. And then, Amr Shmuel, so then Shmuel commented on this bright, as opposed to saying, I hold like Rabbi Yossi, or as opposed to just saying the halakha, the third option was that Shmuel comments on this bright. Some people said, actually, we only really heard it from Rabbi Yehuda in the name of Shmuel and not directly from Shmuel. Halacha ke Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera. That we pass from like Rabbi Yehuda ben Betera, which again means there's no real problem with it. It's just that it might look, right, and what it will look like. And because of that, we should forbid it in all circumstances. And now we have a third opinion. Ki ata Rabin. When Rabin came from Israel, Amal, Rabbi Yochanan, he said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Halacha ke Tanakama. Now there's two ways to read this. Either he holds like Tanakama of Rav Mishnah, which then means Rav holds like Rabbi Yehuda, Shmuel holds like Rabbi Yossi, and Rabbi Yochanan held like Tanakama. Okay, which means we have all three options in terms of Halakha Lamaaseh, all three of them paskin in different ways. Some people explain that Rabbi Yochanan paskin like Tanakama in the Brayta that we just quoted, which is really Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. And we're still left with either Rabbi Yehuda or Rabbi Yossi, and then nobody holds like Tanakama of Rav Mishnah, that it's actually allowed in all circumstances. So there's all different ways to read. Okay, next mission. Now we're getting to all the ways animals can't go out. Okay, now here it's going to be very confusing because the Gemara is not going to specify in most of the situations what the issue is. Again, it's either going to be because it's a masoi, because it looks like a burden, and it's not something the animal generally goes out with, it's clothing of the animal, or it's going to be because it might fall. Okay, most of these I think fall into the category of it might fall, but it's not 100% clear. Sometimes the Gemara will talk about it, sometimes it won't. There's all different interpretations also, as we've seen. And again, most of the Gemara is going to be dealing with is trying to understand what the reality of the mission is, what cases the mission was talking about, because again, the rabbis living in Babylonia were living both in a different time and in a different place, didn't necessarily have the same wording, the same uh, implements, right? It's not clear that everything was done, you know, it was clear that things were not done in the same way, and that caused them to have to figure out what are they talking about. 
So when, which cases can an animal not go out in Rashid Arabi? Lo yetzei gamal b'mitzul telet. You can't go out with a mitzul telet. Okay, what is a mitzul telet? Many interpretations are brought by the Rishoni. Rashi brings a few. Um, I'll, I'll quote a few. It was a strap that they put under the saddle in order when the, when the animal goes up, the saddle starts sliding. So they would put a strap underneath so that the saddle would stay in place. Some people say it was actually a pillow they put under the strap. To, or in order to make it softer on the animal that when the strap, when the saddle starts dripping, uh, dropping and, the, and the, the strap keeps it in place, it might rub against the animal. So they would put a pillow there. Maybe it's time to have a pillow. Some people say it's actually a saddle cloth, which we talked about was allowed for a donkey, but not for a camel or any other animal because they don't get cold as much as um, the donkey does. The Rambam actually says that the habitual talent was really an amulet. And it wasn't something necessary at all. It was just an amulet. So many interpretations. Lo akud velo ragul. This is some sort of tying. We're going to have to see in the Gemara what this is. V'chein shar kol abeimot. And likewise for all animals, not just for the camel. Velo yitshor gemalim zebezebiim shok. You can't tie a whole bunch of camels to each other and pull, okay, like have a string of, right, one string going through all the animals and carry them one after the other. If you want to pull your animal, this is interesting, you're allowed to hold a rope and pull it. It's not considered, this is interesting, it's not considered carrying a rope. If you're holding a rope that's tied to the animal, the animal's walking, you can actually do that. It's not considered carrying, although we'll see that there's, like we said, if you do one to the other, it's a problem. We'll have to see in the Gemara what the problem is with this. But you can take a whole bunch of ropes from different camels into your hand, the Yimshoch, and pull them as long as you don't bind them together. We'll see what the issue is here when we get to it in the Gemara. Tana, so the Brayta says, it, you can't go out with this mitzotele if it's tied to its tail. Now we learn that the issue with the, with the mitzotele is not necessarily that it's not, uh, that it's a masoi, that it's a burden. No, that's not the issue. It is really part of something he usually wears, and it should be okay. However, it might fall off. So if it's tied only to the tail, which is probably the regular way they did it, then it's a problem because it might fall off. But if it's tied to the tail and the hump, then already it's not a problem. Amarava Barapuna, Yotzei Hagamama Mitotela Takshuralo Bashiliata. I don't really understand the reality here, but a shilia is, is a placenta, so or afterbirth. So if the animal has an afterbirth and it's tied, I don't exactly know how this is working, but if it's tied to the afterbirth, it's kind of hanging out of the animal, I don't know why you would do that, but if it's tied to there, it's okay. And what's the reason? This is interesting. Because it would be painful to the, what, what's the issue of it falling off? The animal moves around a lot and often doesn't want things on it. So it will jerk around in order to get something to fall off. But if it's attached to something that if it, the animal tries to pull it off, rip it off, it'll be painful to the animal, then the animal's not going to do that. So that's why if it's tied to the shilia, it's okay. Lo akud velo ragu. Amar Rabbi Yudah, what is akud? He translates, akud akedat yad v'regel. Ah, it sounds like the akeda, right? Bound, bound yad v'regel, just like he Yitzchak ben Abraham. Tying up leg to hand, okay? So you tie each hind leg to each rear leg. Um, sorry, each front leg to each hind leg. So ragul shalo yachof yado al gabez ro'o. What's ragul? That you don't tie each hand to itself. You take each leg, and imagine you, right, the leg has a joint in the middle. You bend it upward, and you would tie it to itself. Okay, that's a ragu. Metive. So now we have a problem with Rav Yehuda's interpretation, particularly the first one. Akud, shte yadayim v'shte chaglayim. Akud, according to this bright test, says, each, right, bind the two legs and the two hands. So, right, the two front legs or the two rear legs. Ragu, shalo yachop yado agabez ro. Sure, that's the same. So that seems to contradict because we said yad lebegel and not, right, Rabbi Huda said yad lebegel and not two raglayim to two yadayim. So hu de amar ki aitana de tanya akor akidat yad lebegel o shte yadav u shte raglayim. Okay, so now it said, ah, he must look at different brighter, which says that akor could be yad regel or yad yad regel regel. And then ragul is still always the same, shale yachop yado agabez ro o v'yikshor. But then they say, no, that doesn't help us. That brighta, akate lo dame. That's still not the same. 
Vishlama Resha Vesefa Anicha. It explains the Akod in the first interpretation is the same. And the Ragol is the same. But Mitziata Kashya, but Akod, according to the right that we just quoted, also says it could be the two Raglaim or the two Yadaim to each other. So therefore, you can't say Rabbi Yudah held like that, Tana, because he would have brought both interpretations. Ela Huda Amar Ki Aitana, Akod Akedat Yatveregel Ki Yitzchak Ben Abraham. They finally find the bright, and this is exactly what Rabbi Huda says, and they say he must hold like the ton of that bright. Moving on. It looks like you're going to the shuk. That's how they would sell animals. If you were selling a whole bunch of animals, you would tie one to the other, and you'd lead them all with the first one. So if you tie your animals that way and go out and with Shudah Rabim on Shabbat like that, it looks like you're selling them. And again, we seem to be very concerned here for what it looks like. We don't want people to think that you're selling animals on Shabbat, and therefore it's forbidden. Avam machnis, but you can put all the ropes in one hand as long as you don't bind them together. So Amravashi, loshanu ela le'inyan kilayim. The issue here that the Gemara is relating to has nothing to do with Shabbat. It has to do with kilayim. What is kilayim? Mixing different breeds. Now, it could be different breeds of animals or it could be different cloths. Like there's loyach roa shor v'chamor yachdav. You can't take a shor and a chamor and plow your field using both of them at the same time. That's considered kilayim for ben heimat. And right besides also crossbreeding. And you can't have a baguette of shatnes where you have wool and linen. So what are we talking about? Kilaim de mai, which type of kilaim? Ilaim a kilaim de adam. Maybe it means just like you can't do plowing with a shore and a chamor together, you also can't pull these animals with the person. In other words, the, the person can't be pulling the animals. It's like they're all doing the work together, and that's kilaim. You can't say that because the hat's not. Adam utarim kulam lachoshulim shok. A human can pull an animal, that's not called kilaim. A human can also plow with an animal, that's not called kilaim. It's animal with animal. So it can't be that. Ela kilaim de chavalim, if you want to say it's with the, the ropes, that you have one rope that was made of flax and one that was made of uh, wool, and you want to pull them, well, that, that's also can't be, because v'hatanya, hatochet tzchifa achat en achibor. If you tie linen and wool together with one little string, that's not considered shotness. Okay, that's not kilaim. So therefore, the assumption here is that he's pulling them all together, right, there. They're not, right, if they're bound, they're bound by a one little string or something. It's not like he was sewing here everything together. So it can't be that. So what are the answers? So therefore, how could it be kilayim at all? So the answer, la'olam kilayim de chavalim. It really is the ropes. What it means, shaloyikroch, is loyikroch and tie them together well in a good knot. Now, if you tie them in a good knot and you have some that are wool and some that are linen, then you're going to end up with a crime of kilayim. And now it's very strange to explain the mission this way because then it really has nothing to do with it. It's just saying, if you do walk out with your ropes, carrying them in a way that's allowed on Shabbat, just make sure that there's no kilayim in the ropes, that you're not mixing two different things. Amr Shmuel, Shmuel says, by the way, if you're going to do this, be careful. Okay, now you have to think about when you're holding the ropes. So you're holding in one hand, the ropes are toward the animal, and on the other side of your hand, right by which, where your pinky is, you're gonna have the extra part of the rope sticking out. What he says is don't allow more than a tepach of rope to stick out on the other end. Why? Because even though you're allowed to take this rope on Shabbat, because you're not really carrying, because you're just pulling the animal, even though that's the case, people will see more than a tepach. If they see more than a tepach sticking out, what's gonna happen? They're gonna think, if they see it from the other end and they're only looking at your hand on that side, they'll see you're holding a rope and they won't see that on the other side it's attached to animals. And therefore, don't leave out more than a tepach so it won't be so noticeable to people who might see and think that you're actually carrying a whole rope. If you only have a little bit sticking out, then they're going to assume there's something on the other side. If you have a lot sticking out, it might look like you're just holding this. So again, very worried about what people are going to think. So Shmuel says, as long as there's not a tepach. So now the Gemara questions, but from the house of Shmuel, which is the same person, it says, they taught two tfachim can't be sticking out, not one. One is okay. Two already, two hands breaths is a problem. Amar Abaye, Hashadam Shmuel Tepach, Vitanadim Shmuel Tfachim, 
Shmuel halacha lamaseh atala shmuel. And since we have one version where Shmuel said a tefach, then we have the people from his house taught two tefachs. It must be that Shmuel really held it was two tefachs. But when he came halacha lamaseh, he said, let's be a little bit more stringent about this so that we don't have any issues. And he basically said, halacha lamaseh, we should be more stringent and make sure it's only one tefach sticking out. Then they said, wait a minute though, but there's a bright that says something different. That the tefach has to do with something else entirely. It sounds like it's not what the part that's in his hand. It sounds like it has nothing to do with where it says it sounds like you can't pick the rope up more than a tefach. I'm sorry, it has to be at least a tefach off the ground. So they say, oh, that doesn't have to do with this. Those are two different things. As I said, there's two sides of the rope. There's the side that's near your thumb, which is attached to the animal. That's the side that can't be more than a tefach off the ground. Because if it's, I'm I, sorry, opposite. It has to be more than a tefach off the ground. Because even if, what did we say? If people see you on the other, people see the side by your pinky, they might not know you're carrying a rope that's attached to an animal. So you have to make sure not to leave out very much. And then it'll be obvious that there's something on the other side. If someone's looking on the other side, even if they see it's attached to the animal, if it's close to the ground, they might not be able to notice. I think about it. If you have this rope all the way on the ground and the animal's over there, they won't realize that it's attached to the animal. Right? Only if you kind of see it in midair will you see that it's attached to something. If it's kind of dragging on the floor, they'll think that you're just carrying a rope that's dragging on the floor. And therefore, it also has to be a tapak off the ground, or more than a tapak off the ground, so that people don't think that you're actually just holding a rope. Okay, new Mishnah, more cases. We're slowly, we're getting to the end of this page. We're, like I promised, we'll get to some more interesting things. Okay, now we're back to the donkey and the things a donkey can't go out with. So the donkey can't go out with the saddle cloth if it's tied to it. Now remember, what did we say? If it's tied to it, right, sorry, if it's not tied to it, we said if it's not tied to it at all, or really what it really means is if it's not tied to it from before Shabbat. And then we said there were different interpretations where Ashi said if it's not tied before Shabbat, then it really becomes a masoy and not its general clothing. Or Tosvot had said, we're worried that people are going to think that you're taking it to a, a far distance or you just really wanted to get the saddle cloth out into Rashid or Abim. So you threw it on your animal and figuring your animal will take it out. The lobe is zug. This is the zug, the, the bell that's on the animal. Even if it's pakuk and it's not making any sound, before we talk about the zug, that if you want, but you can put the cock in to make it not make sound and you can put it on the animal if it's in your own territory. But if it goes outside into Rashid or Abim, it can't go out even if it's not making any noises. Remember, there's an issue of making noise on Shabbat. Even if it's not making noise, still it's a problem for it to carry it, okay? This is considered carrying. Below the sulam Shabbat Sabaro and not the sulam, a ladder on its neck. This seems very unclear what it's talking about. We'll see when we get to the Gemara. And not a ritzua strap on its leg. The Gaonim explain what's the strap for, potentially for a fractured leg. Um, we'll see in the Gemara that another way of interpreting it could be that it's to protect its leg from getting injured. Okay. They can't go out with these strings. Why would they wear strings, the Tarnagolim? It was a way of identifying who these roosters belong to. Okay, so if people would put identifying, I was thinking like your luggage, people put strings on the luggage to know that with, this is my black suitcase that looks like everybody else's, so same thing with the tarni golim. The low biritsuasha baraglehem, and not straps that are on their legs. The ein has charim yosim ba'agalash atachat halya. The rams can't go out with a wagon under its tail. Okay, we'll talk about what kind of wagon this was. The ein ha rechilim yotzim chnunot. The ewes can't go out chnunot. We're going to have to explain what chnunot is. The ein ha egel yotze begimon. Okay, the egel can't go out, the young foals can't go out with a gimon. We're going to have to explain what that is. The lo para or hakupal. Okay, they said that's with the, the um, skin of a hedgehog. See why they would do that. The lo beritsuah karneha, and not with a ritsuah strap between its, um, between its horns. Talked about this before. Um, we'll, we'll get back to it. And now we get to the big line, which is going to get us off on a huge tangent. Okay, 
And we know Rebel Lazar ben Azariah was a great gadol, if you remember in the story of Rabban Gamliel, when they kicked him out from being the head of the yeshiva, they brought in Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah in his place. So he was very well known. He was also very wealthy, which is going to come up at the end of the page also. Anyway, they say about his para that he would go out with this ritzua against the will of the rabbis. They were not happy with this. So first of all, it seems strange that Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah would do something against the will of the rabbis. Another thing the Gemara is going to say is strange is, what do you mean, his para? It sounds like he had one para, and he was very wealthy. He clearly had many parot. And I'll just give you the, the Koran had an interpretation, which I didn't see the source for, didn't say the source, and I don't know where it comes from. Um, I didn't have enough time to look it up, but if you want to, you can try to find where this is from. But some people say that this actually wasn't his para at all, and it wasn't a para, and it was actually talking about his wife. <laughs> okay, don't be alarmed that they call his wife a cow. But what they were trying to do was, they were saying his wife would go out carrying something, and they were upset at Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah that she went out carrying something she shouldn't be carrying. Again, it, it's not like she had horns and the, the ritzua was between her horns. I'm not sure, according to that interpretation, what she was doing. But whatever she was doing, they were against what his wife was doing. Why did they call it the para? Because they didn't want to embarrass. It's funny, right? You'd think to be called cow would be humiliating. But they didn't want to embarrass him or her, so they just said it in this lashon of, para, okay, where they didn't really mean it. What's interesting about it is it doesn't really belong here. It should be in the next paragraph, not but maybe because they called it a para, they called her a para, so they put it in this mission. But the Gemara doesn't go with that interpretation. I don't know where that interpretation of the mission came in from. In any case, we're going to get into a whole aside because of that one line. Okay, back to the Gemara. Now the Gemara is going to try to explain what are all these cases, and sometimes they'll try to explain why they're forbidden, although like, it's not going to be so clear Again, whether they're forbidden because they might fall off or whether because we call this the Masur. My time. So the first thing is the Mirda. Kidamaran. Ah, we already talked about that whole thing, and the concern is it might fall off. And that's, or, or maybe it's because it appears to, it's a Masoi because you didn't put it on from before Shabbat. Anyway, that we all dealt with before. Now we're moving on to the next one. Below Bazug, Afapishu Pakuk. Nishum Demechse, Kemanda Azalachinka. Here they actually give you the interpretation. Why can't you go out with the bell on it? because that's how they would go out when they would sell them. Again, it looks like you're taking it out to the shuk. So you can't go out if it has a spell around its neck because that's the way they would sell them. Below the Sulam Shabbat Tzavaron. Now we're going to get a little away from trying to figure out why it's Asura. They're really going to explain what are these cases. What is this Sulam Shabbat Tzavaron? Amal Lafuna Be Loa. It was something that was attached to the jaw. Lamai Abdele, what would they do this? You can see the Gemara didn't really recognize this so much. Why would they attach something to the jaw of the animal? Often, what do the animals do if they have a wound, right? If I have a scab, I'll often pick at it, right? That's what people, there's people who are known to do this, right? They'll pick at scabs. So the animal, instead of picking with his hands, doesn't really have hands, so it uses its mouth to pick at it, right? I'm sure you've seen animals do that all the time. So this was an implement that they would put on, the, they were kind of a muzzle type thing that they would put around the jaw to prevent the animal from picking at scabs. So that's something that you can't go out with on Shabbat. Below Ritzua Shabiraglo, what's this Ritzua for? Da'avdele le Gizra. Okay, it's now either to prevent injury or if there was injury, like we said. Either it's to like, like a kind of splint for a fractured leg or it's to prevent injury so that the legs don't hit up against each other and, and kind of hit into each other. As we said, this was a siman so that they don't confuse them. Right, who's Tarnagolim or who's? Below Beritzua, okay, this is the para, uh, this is the Tarnagolim. They put these Ritzuot on so that they don't break utensils, okay? Wait till we get to Baba Kama when we talk about all these things that break utensils, right? So that the Tarnagolim don't break other people's kelim. Right, they would kind of tie their legs together, right, to make it so that they wouldn't do this. What was the purpose of the Agala? so that their tail wouldn't get injured from the ground. There's sharp things on the ground, and they'll hit into things, rocks. So they would put a little wagon, I'm sure it wasn't a big wagon, it was like a little something underneath to kind of catch the tail so that it wouldn't rub against the floor. And again, I think here the problem is that the wagon probably wasn't fastened on so well and it might fall off. Or again, maybe you say it's a masoy, it's a burden. It's not so clear. We're going to have a number of interpretations of Chunun, and we're actually going to get something a little bit comical here. So just remember, because we're going to have the same scene in a minute, 
Rabbi Ahab Ra'ula is sitting in front of Rabbi Chista, and he starts to sing. Misha'ashe goes to Zinota, when they sheared the sheep, what would they do? Tomim la ezek and they would dip some cotton into oil. Umenichim al padachtan, they would put it on the forehead of the animal. Kadesh alotitzganein, think about the animal, uh, it has all that wool on it, you shear the wool, the animal's going to be freezing. So they would put a little patch of, of oil, with oil on it, like kind of like a bath type thing, right, to soak it in oil, make it very pleasant for the animal. So that's his explanation of Knudo. Now you can see here what's happening is that the, the rabbis are suggesting, um, the animals are, uh, the rabbis are suggesting different ways, right? What could this possibly be? Okay, well, let's come up with a, as you say, creative interpretation. So what's Rav Chista's reaction to this interpretation? Amalei Rav Chista in Ken, Asite Marukva. Marukva was a wealthy person. I think he was even the Reish Galuta, uh, the exilarch. So he says, you're making the, the animal like the Reish Galuta, the, oh, he sits there with this oil on his forehead. What are you talking about? They didn't do that to animals. That's like a really spoiled animal. So, here comes in the next student to suggest his interpretation. The Yatza the Kamer, he suggests, okay, forget it. It's not after they shear the mass already, we're spoiling the animal. But after the animal gives birth, that already, they take two now, he says. And why two? Well, it said, plural. So they must take two of these. And what do they say? Thanks, I see uh, Tova corrected me. He was the Av Beitin, okay? Um, but check, because I really thought he was also maybe the Resh Galuta at some point. But uh, I see Rashi says he was the Av Beitin. Like you said, he was wealthy in the Av Beitin. But uh, anyway, worth checking because I seem to remember associating him also with the Reish Galuta, but I'm not sure. Anyway, maybe it was after they were pregnant, after they gave birth, and then, you know, then already we're not saying that's spoiled, that's, you know, something more necessary. They went through child, you know, childbirth, an animal birth. Anyway, so because of that, they would put one, with, they would put on on the forehead, and one on the womb, to warm up the animal. Amale Rav Nachman, now comes in Rav Nachman, remember Rav Nachman, he was married to Yalta, who was the daughter of the Resh Galuta. Remember the famous story with her where she broke those 400 barrels of wine? So what does Rav Nachman say? In Kena Sita Yalta. <laughs> That's also like my wife Yalta, who needs all sorts of attention and, and you know, likes being spoiled. But you wouldn't do that to an animal even after pregnancy, come on. So El Amarapuna, Rapuna gives a third interpretation. There's a specific tree called a Hanun. They would bring it to the animal. It would make it sneeze. And then all the worms on the head, as soon as the animal would sneeze, you know when animals sneeze, they go, you know, explode. And all the worms would go flying off. Okay, so it was a method to save them from the worms. That already isn't spoiling. That's really, right, the animals are constantly trying to get the worms off. So, okay, I see Caroline wrote me, thank you, we're going backwards here, but people are helping me out here. The safari says he was the ex -log. so, okay. Thank you. Um, so now they say, wait a minute, if it's so that, now this goes back to a question we had yesterday. Remember there were the Sharim, why only the males and not the females? So here they're gonna say, this is the females. Why only the females and not the males? If it's to get rid of worms, Right, then we could see why it would only be the females. That, uh, why would it be only females and not males? So we have his telling Nami. So what do they answer? Again, male-female differences. Because they're constantly goring each other, right? They play very rough and tough. They, the worms fall off their heads all the time because they're constantly goring each other and that's causing that worms to fall off. It's the females that are more calm and they're not fighting against each other they specifically need something else, and they would bring this Hanun tree, and that explains Hanunot. Shmuel Nazira Amar kiss Maderitma. He says it was actually from a from a broom from a broom tree, and not from this eighth Hanun. So now the Gemara points out, well, Bishlama de Rafuna, he's the only one who really makes sense. Hainu de Katani Chnunot. He's the only one who interpreted the connection between Chnunot and what they did, because he said it was from this eighth Hanun. Emily Rabbanam, but all the other interpretations, my chanunot. So they say, ah, because all of the interpretations were da'abdina le miltet imurachamin alayhu. They're doing something where we have sympathy on, we're, we're sympathetic to the animal, or we're doing something to calm the animal. And that's where it connects with chanun, either to get the worms off 
or for, you know, as we said, the oil to calm the animal down. Okay. Ena egel yotze begimon. My egel begimon. Amor puna bar nira. It was a, um, right, this is a small yoke they would put on the animal uh, to train the young animals to wear a yoke. Now, what does a yoke do? It makes her head bow down. So, or bend down. Amor of Yelazar, my mashman to high gimon listen to mechav. So, how do we know that gimna? Gimon has anything to do with bending. Are you going to bow down the way the bulrush tree bows down? And a gimon is the same root as gimon. And from there they get bending is associated with gimon. Okay, there were all these creepy crawlers like rats and other things that would sometimes nurse from the, the cow. They would go and steal some milk. So they would put this this strap of hedgehog skin on the animal, on the, on the cow, to prevent other animals from nursing from. The lobu ritsua shabain karneha. So ilarav, so now they say this ritsua between the karnaim of the, of the cow, why is this a problem? So if it's rav, bain lenoi, bain l'shamer. This goes back to the other interpretation that we saw before. Whether you hang it for noi or whether you hang it for protection, remember the cow doesn't need a ritsua to lead it. So this is what we call shmirai yitera, extra protection. So whether it's for noy or whether it's for protection, Rav is going to think it's asur in any case. And ilu shmuel, lenoi asur, l'shamer mutar. So basically, you'd have to say that the Mishnah, according to Shmuel, is only talking about when you use it for decorative purposes, because if you were using the ritzuah, the strap, to lead the animal, it would be allowed. Okay, finally, we get to, we're almost at the end of Shir, we get to finally, we're going to start the interesting section, which I says, as I said, is going to continue into tomorrow. I'm actually speaking later today for something for the Moatza and Ranana, and I'm going to teach this whole section into tomorrow's all about communal responsibility and leadership and what are, what are expectations of leaders. Um, uh, appropriate Yom topic for what's our responsibility toward others, toward our, our, our country, toward fellow man, toward and what's the responsibility of our leaders. So, Paratosh Rabiel Azar Ben Azariah. Kumar says, what do you mean? If you have one para, the para of Raviyal Azar ben Azari, it doesn't make any sense. Bahamara, forget about the fact that we know he was wealthy. Here we're going to bring something even more specific that said he had a lot of animals. Bahamara, the Amr the Amr of Yehuda Mahav, Chesar Alpe Egle Hai, have a master of Yel Azar ben Azari, may Edri call Shanta the Shanta. He would take Masrot, at a tenth of all, right? This was Master Behema. He would take 12,000 of them, he would give his Master. That means he had. 10 times the amount, okay? He was, he had tons of animals. So it can't be only at one. Tana, so there's a bright bit, explains, lo shelo haita, ela shel shechem to haita. It was actually his neighbor's para. When we talk shelo michaba, and because he didn't reprimand her and tell her that it was forbidden for an animal to go out like this, nikreit al shmo. Okay? This is interesting. This shows you that if your neighbor is doing something wrong and you don't comment on it, especially if you're a real Azar Azariah, who has the ability to comment and, and reprimand people, and you don't do it, so he became responsible for it, okay? This is about responsibility. Here we're talking about rabbis, although we'll see that it's not just rabbis or leaders, but it sounds like the responsibility extends to everybody to really rebuke others, okay? Now, let's keep going on, and then we'll talk for a quick minute about it, and then we'll pick up with this tomorrow. So now they say, Rav, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi, Rabbi Chaviva, the four of them, Matnu, they all taught, and then break for a minute, parentheses, Bekule Seder Moed, and all of Seder Moed, Ki Koki Haigizuga, Halufe Rabbi Yochanan, Ma'al Rabbi Yonatan. Every time you see these four, it's actually a mistake. Rabbi Yochanan doesn't belong here because he didn't live at the same time as all these people, but it's really Rabbi Yonatan. Okay, so that's just a correction. And this is what they said, and here comes the big line. Call me Shepshadim Chop on Chebeto, Velomicha, Nitpasal on Chebeto. If you have the power to reprimand your pe the people of your house and you don't, you become responsible for their sins. Uh, if you can do it to the people in your city, you be res you're become responsible for all the sins of your city. Now here, by the way, it doesn't say necessarily a leader, although you would think maybe a leader has more ability to, to go to the people of the city. This is interesting, right? I don't know who has the power to do this, but if you are in a position where you can reprimand all the people, rebuke all the people of the world, and you don't, it's pas akol olam kulo. Okay, they may be exaggerating a little bit, but what they're trying to say is you have communal responsibility. Now, on the one hand, this looks like 
we're not so into rebuke, right? Rebuke, we always find, we call this piadatit sometimes if you're talking about religion, right? People are trying to force their religion on others. It sounds like a very non-modern concept. On the other hand, if you look at it in the perspective of we're trying to talk about social responsibility and we're all responsible for each other and you're therefore responsible for everybody's actions. Okay, last thing we're going to read for today, Amara Papa Vahane to Beresh Galuta. They say, and the house and the, and the house of Beresh Galuta, which we mentioned earlier, nits pursu akule alma. They're responsible for all the sins of all the world. In other words, they're very powerful people. They have the capabilities and they don't do anything about it. And therefore they're responsible. And now we're going to prove it from a pasuk. Ki ad amar Rabbi Hanina, ma'i tachsiv Hashem b'mishpat yavom zikne amo v'sachav. The Gemara assumes, or Rabbi Hanina assumes that, um, that the zikneim don't sin. So what does this mean? Zikneim o v'sachav. Im sarim chatu, zikneim ma chatu, what does zikneim do? It's their responsibility that they didn't do anything for others. They didn't cause others to return to better ways. Okay, we're going to talk about this a lot more tomorrow when we get into other sugyot about this, about the responsibility. There's also a new parak of Gefek from the Rosh Hashivah Drisha. Their goal, by the way, in their, in their talks are to basically um, teach people how to learn Gemara with Rashi and Tosfo, work on skills building. So if you're interested in learning how to learn toast folks, it's a really good um, thing to watch. It's about, usually about 10, 15 minutes. And they go through one toast, but on the page, it comes out every Wednesday. So it's out now for, it goes really with tomorrow's daf at the top of the daf, but it has to do with this issue of tochacha. So you can listen to it today or you can listen to tomorrow after we finish the sugya. Um, definitely recommend it. Okay, have a yomatz mitzameach, everybody.